Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today we're talking about AI, Palestinian art and coronavirus victims in Peru. The Bucharest Biennial asks artificial intelligence to be its curator. A Palestinian artist manifests peace through his art. And the walls of this Peruvian neighborhood has a memorial for the dead. If curators feared the coronavirus could cost them their jobs, now they have to worry about robots replacing them. And it's all because of the Bucharest Biennial. The artificial intelligence program Jarvis will select the artworks that will be showcased at the 2020 Bucharest Biennial. It will do so by accessing databases of universities and galleries. It might be fitting, since this edition of the event will take place in virtual reality. Well, we have Jarvis's creator here, Razvan Ion, who joins me from Vienna. Hi, Razvan. Thanks so much for coming on our show today. Good afternoon. Okay, so why don't we start with this? What is Jarvis um, capable of as a curator compared to a human curator? Um, first of all, I think it's, it's a little bit uh, too much to compare uh, an AI curator with a human curator. Uh, Jarvis can do almost everything uh, a human can do, like any AI, but uh, except two things, which for the moment we did not uh, get that with uh, artificial intelligence, it's understanding and meaning. Uh, but still, it's a concept which we cannot yet work with, uh, with um, artificial intelligence. But Jarvis can do... Um, a lot of things can write the, the concept, can uh, organize the exhibition, uh, can choose the artist. It, uh, everything is from a database we've constructed out of databases around the world. Okay, uh, Razvan, why don't you explain to us why you don't like the comparison between a human curator and an AI curator? Because no, obviously, I, I, I mean, I, 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 the reason why people compare these two things is pretty obvious because normally humans do this job. So why don't you tell me what that comparison makes you feel like. And no, it's not about that. It's not I like it or I dislike it. Uh, it's just a fact, a scientific fact. Uh, for the moment, we didn't invent everything that can replace a human. So that's a non-discussion, actually. Because you, you cannot discuss about something which is, does not exist yet. So you do not think that uh, the discourse around this is right, which is can... AI replace humans in, when it comes to curating. Okay, so still though, it's interesting that an AI, that AI will be the curator of a biennial. So I want to even like further investigate that. How will it work, for example? I mean, we know that curators, for example, start with maybe setting up uh, the curatorial tone, the theme behind a bi biennial. Is this the way? Are you going to start? How is it going to work, the whole process? Ja Jarvis, for the first, will write the concept and then accordingly to the concept we choose as an artist. So it will work as a human curator, basically. Um, but uh, again, what is uh, the difference is Jarvis can work faster mm -hmm. and, for example, can process uh, thousands of texts in a, a couple of hours, which a human curator cannot. Uh, also, I think it's very important to um, to think about the uh, artificial intelligence as a as a way of making things more democratic, uh -huh. because at, at this moment all these games uh, in the art world they play uh, all the people they play on the on the art world. I mean, I know this scene from 25 years, and still I think it's not really democratic. I think Jarvis can bring a little bit of more. Uh, democratic choice in uh, in the art field. Okay. So we can see more new artists than we see right now, because most of the curators are working with the same artists. Mm -hmm. If you look at the what they do, an exhibition, a biennial, you will find kind of the same artists in the same curatorial act. Okay. So do you think that it will also democratize the relationship between? a curator and an artist because uh, well a lot of curators star curators are being criticized more and more for you know stealing the stage really from the artists so do you think that could also bring a new perspective uh, for sure 
first of all, it will not be um, any, uh, let's say, uh, counterposition between artist and the curator because Jarvis cannot fight with you. So Jarvis will do just what he is supposed to do. And what I really like about artificial intelligence is the fact that emotional intelligence are not involved. Uh, most of the people who will react and will say, yes, but this is art, it's about emotion. Uh, what is emotion in uh, selling works in a gallery? What is emotion in when you choose only the artists you prefer to choose because later you will need them to be increasing the price uh, in the galleries or be increasing a museum, which is uh, usual. So I think Jardis will do things which uh, are supposed to do a curator, but also not involving this type of uh, connections because Jarvis doesn't have friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, on the other hand, obviously biases, and we talked about curatorial biases and why the art world is, you know, being criticized for being not democratic enough and all that. But then obviously biases come from subjectivity and really like authenticity and the human touch and the human element. So in that sense, not having that subjectivity is good for democratization, but then it could be bad for several other things. Do you fear that you won't put up a show that is not as authentic as the other biennials? No, I'm not afraid of that because what we do, it's actually, um, what we will do, it's a biennial in a virtual gallery curated by artificial intelligence. So it will be a new idea to explore. It's not only uh, how Jarvis will function or how the gallery will be in the VR, but the mechanism, the process is more important than the result because the process will bring us new ideas and it will bring us a new type of working. Uh, this is very important because progress comes only from this type of uh, trying different ideas. This is how the curator was invented, yeah. invented us. Razwan, I want to put forward that the curatorial process in this biennial is actually an artwork as well. It's a performance, is it? Uh, yeah, you can say that, but... Mm. We still work on the on the words, proper words, to define what we do, uh, because it's something really new. And uh, uh, as you uh, suspect, I think uh, we work uh, relentless to making Jarvis more and more, uh, more and more intelligent, more and more uh, expanding. And uh, uh, I truly believe. Uh, it will be a very interesting exhibition and we can analyze the possibility of working with an AI curator. I don't really believe we are prepared for an AI artist. Of course, most of the people will say yes, but it is existing at, at this moment, but it's not really an AI artist. So I think it will be interesting to explore these possibilities mm -hmm. of working with artificial intelligence. Because at the end of the day, everybody will be happy. Think about, uh, Jarvis will never think about uh, all these arrangements on the, on the field. Uh, if Jarvis is hired as a curator for a gallery, it will think only about the artists of the gallery. Uh, it will think only about how the gallery can achieve something out of that. Uh, usually a human, I am a curator, uh, and a human usually this subjectivity you talk about and we talk, we really talk, it's, it's like it's something extraordinary, interesting, human, uh, beautiful. Sometimes it's not because there are other interests behind that mm -hmm. subjectivity. Okay, Razvan, Ion, it is so interesting to think about what this can bring into the art world. But unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for joining us. Jihad al Ghul lost his leg at a young age during an Israeli bombing of a refugee camp. But the Palestinian artist is trying to focus on a peaceful future for his country. Nur Sena has more. In April 2008, Israeli bombs rained down on the Gaza Strip. A Palestinian youth 
Jihad al Ghul lost his leg in the attack as he was watching his city bombed at a refugee camp. He was 15 years old. The injury has motivated me to develop skills, succeed and move forward in the field of art. This place where I work at now was an archaeological site. It's around 100 years old. I began restoring it around nine months ago, hoping to turn it into a media and art production and cultural centre. Since that incident, he's been studying art through any books and magazines he could get his hands on. Today, at 28, he's become an artist who's trying to build a life for himself with his paintings. He fills this old building with murals of colours and flowers. Al Ghul also sells oil paintings online. I live in a rented house and work to make a living. My income is not enough and I'm very tired of trying to make a living. Most of his works on sale depict a traditional Palestinian culture and its people. He's also painting the regional landscape with a historical touch. He's exhibited his works locally and internationally. On his Facebook page, he calls Palestine my beauty since childhood, and that he paints to spread peace and beauty in the world. HBO says one of its success stories this year is Scoop, the first big-budgeted film the crime-solving gang got since their critical flop 20 years ago. But critics say the newest installment isn't much better. Let's see why. Ready. Popcorn. Butter. Nachos. Cheese. Fruit beer with red licorice straw. Right here. <laughs> Maybe it's time we made our new movie. Hanna-Barbera's five-decade-old franchise is back with the movie Scoob. Scooby, Shaggy, Daphne, and Velma band together to stop a ghost dog from bringing the, quote, dog apocalypse. 20 years ago, Scooby-Doo was a box office success, thanks to Warner Brothers' nicely sized budget. But critics panned the live action flick, and smaller budgeted sequels floated out into the ether. This time, HBO says its latest installment has struck gold calling it the most watched film of the summer on its streaming platform. And the critics seem to say that's a mystery even Daphne can't solve. The Sunday Times calls the animation cheap looking. Vulture says the script sounds like it was written by a Twitter bot. And CNN says for a kid's cartoon, it's just not that much fun. Ouch. But look on the bright side. Even though Scoop has a 49% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes, that means not all the critics hated it, right? MovieWeb did say it's a rash spectacle of elaborate chase scenes. This is Velma. Hi. And that's Daphne. Hey. I'm Shaggy. And this is... So maybe there's still hope for Warner Brothers, which is hungry for an animated franchise hit. In the past, the company was known as one of the most successful animation houses. Although, the place has been a dry well for some time now. But it's not like they would pair up Scooby with the Suicide Squad, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Shaggy and Except Scooby. they may. <laughs> Director James Gunn says that a Scooby-Doo and Suicide Squad crossover movie is possible. And while that seems like a bad joke, Gunn was a writer for the Scooby-Doo theatrical release from 20 years ago and is the current Telmer of Suicide Squad. So maybe Gunn is the guy to save Scoop from the critics, or he may end up being the villain at the end who gets his mask torn off. <laughs> and now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of arts and culture. Cirque du Soleil is reopening in Mexico after filing for bankruptcy protection. Performance in the Hoya show returned to the stage after a four-month hiatus from the coronavirus. Cirque had been forced to cancel all of its 44 shows, putting the Montreal-based operation in financial jeopardy. During the lockdown, Cirque had to furlough 95% of its employees and accept a purchase offer from its creditors. 
Kochi Muziris Biennial has announced the artists that will appear in its fifth edition. Shubigu Rao will be curating this year's edition titled In Our Veins Flow Ink and Fire. The list includes Ali Sheri, Cecilia Vicuña and Imanissa. The event is scheduled to run from December to April. The 10th edition of the iHeart Radio Music Festival will be held virtually. Coldplay, BTS and Miley Cyrus are confirmed to perform at this year's show. The show will be taped in Los Angeles and Nashville between September the 18th and the 19th without an audience. The two-part special will air on the CW Network the following week. Peru is one of the places where the severity of the coronavirus is felt most deeply. It has one of the highest death rates, with more than 13,000 in a day. Well, we want to talk about one Peruvian artist who struggles to prevent the deceased from being forgotten. Vibrant colors and smiling faces on the walls. These portraits belong to the victims of the coronavirus in the Leticia district of Lima. They're made by one of their neighbor's contemporary artists, Daniel Manrique. Just like Jolka, while she was supposed to stay home, she was selling popcorn from a small stand on the street because she needed money. I paint them because for me it's like a memory, a human memory. With my work, I paint these neighbors who fell into the pandemic, into the confinement and could not say goodbye. The artist also draws and paints portraits of those who died, just to present them to the victim's relatives. I started to capture the victims on paper and send them via WhatsApp to their close family. And I started to draw those who were falling one after the other. And suddenly, I realized that there were more than 20 of them. And while the pandemic took away the possibility of organizing funerals, Manrique's work acts as a memorial for those families whose lost loved ones. A bit of happiness and comfort, because I feel that in a way, seeing her portrayed makes us feel that she hasn't gone away completely. But while the art brings peace to some, the grim reality is that in Peru, Manrique hasn't yet painted his last mural. A textile workshop in a small Czech village is trying to survive in our era of fast fashion. While H&M and Zara are pumping out clothes left and right, these Czechs are relying on a method that goes back hundreds of years. Nursena has more. In the southeast of Czech Republic, a small village called Oleshnitsa found a way to keep one of its traditions alive in the middle of a pandemic. The Czech government made wearing a mask in public mandatory in March. And for Yuri Danzinger, this meant a wider clientele. Between March and June, in a village of about 1,700 inhabitants, he says he sold more than 1,000 blueprint cotton face masks. It's not like in the past when the poorest people used it as work clothes, bed covers, scarves and aprons. That's not the case anymore. Other than face masks, he usually applies this technique to aprons, tablecloths and folk dance costumes. Danzinger comes from a long line of blueprint craftsmen who are trying to keep a tradition alive in the 21st century. Modrotisk, or blueprinting, is a traditional textile printing technique that dates back to the early 16th century. In the 18th and 19th centuries, this technique was very popular in Europe. Not only working classes, but also the rich would bring their linens and cottons to be adorned with flowers. However, the Industrial Revolution took speed in the 20th century, and factories could reproduce more designs more quickly, leaving many craftsmen without a job. But not Danzinger, whose family has been in the industry since the 1800s. 
tak to už je dneska široký spektrum. We have a broad range of customers today, from people who buy it for pleasure to folk groups. We also sell lots of blueprint souvenirs to tourists. Jo, jako pro turisty, jako suvenýry a tak dále, takže... In an attempt to help preserve it, UNESCO added this tradition to the list of intangible world heritages in 2018. Danzinger says people come and go, but he hopes that the craft will stay the same forever. A coronavirus lockdown can be super boring for some people and a reason to shoot a superhero movie for others. One Ukrainian did just that when he turned his apartment into a movie set. The US military was working on creating a generation of super soldiers. The superheroes we know have taken the summer off, which means villains are on the loose. But have no fear, because Apple Man is here. He's lived like a hermit. What the hell do you want from me? He's a result of a top-secret experiment by the U.S. military, and only he can stop Dr. Bergerman, who wants to annihilate humanity. Stop Dr. Bergerman. Apple trees will never blossom again. The creator of Apple Man, the action comedy short film, is Ukrainian director Vasil Moskalenko. The idea came to him during a coronavirus lockdown, and his tiny apartment didn't cause a setback whatsoever. What's, uh, a butch Here we are in the ordinary corridor of a typical Ukrainian apartment from where the action of my film starts. One of the characters was walking holding a machine gun and looked into the bathroom. And that scene was filmed for a reason. We filmed this shot to make people believe that it was shot in the apartment because many people when they see the depth of shot picture graphics they say you guys are lying why did you say you filmed it in the apartment when you did it at a film studio that's why we used this kind of special identification mark Dr. Bergerman a team of 10 people worked on the project not to mention, Moskalenko played all 12 characters in the film. As for the decorations, costumes and props, they were all household items. And Colonel Booz. And does this voice sound familiar? We expected an attack to come from deep space. But... Well, it's none other than Marvel's voiceover actor, Stefan Ashton Frank, who was happy to donate his talents. The trailer, uh... The trailer has no budget, I say some nominal figure of one dollar, but there is no proper budget because I involved my colleagues and friends who agreed to work for free. For the sake of creativity and for a cool product, they've helped me do the superhero project. And the head of the Producers Guild of Ukrainian Television Academy actually thinks this film could garner global success. To be honest, I think that Apple Man may be our alternative to Deadpool because finally it's possible to tell the story of superheroes with humor and irony, but without pathos and heroism. If this joke created by Vassil in pandemic times turns into a big hit and suddenly Marvels buys it, Vassil will shoot it and it will get a successful release. And I'll feel proud, a good sense of humor and great creativity can turn a joke into a blockbuster. But first, Moskolanko needs to cast his heroine, and he has one particular actor in mind. The director shot a trailer just for Jennifer Aniston, as a sort of invitation to be his Apple girl. And maybe he has a chance. After all, she ended up liking the Apple Man trailer on Instagram. You are the greatest actress of all times. That's it on this episode of Showcase. I'm Elis Tereketnev. Remember to keep up with our YouTube channel, Insta and Twitter accounts. But before we go, the National Gallery of Art in Washington is reopening, but should it? We have this look for you. See you next time.
think that uh, particularly within the art market, we're seeing a big desire for people to reopen. And the reason for that is, of course, economic, and there may be political pressures as well. But, um, you know, I, th I think that the biggest motivating factor for people wanting to reopen is wanting to be able to sustain their businesses economically.